This is our Triumph GC6. It's a pretty cool little car that really doesn't get enough love due to the historically poor quality control of its parent company, British Leyland. Nevertheless, it's a good looking car that may give you deja vu if you've ever seen a Datsun 240Z or Jag E-Type, which you probably have, as they were both massively more popular. Anyway, ours needed some TLC, and after only four years of repairing rust, thank you Canada, we are now making good progress with the Resto Mod. Resto Mod? Oh, you've gone way past that. Let's not get bogged down with annoying little details like what defines a Resto Mod. Ultimately, we're building our car the way we'd like to think a retro GT6 would be made today. Imagine with me a Jag F Type R shrunk. That's what we want. It's a bit ambitious perhaps, but we've taken drastic action by selling the entire drivetrain to build a new one. So far, we've made a good start on our new custom chassis. Yes, we're building a whole new chassis. Last time, we mounted our Corvette differential, got some new wheels and tires, narrowed the axle shafts, and built some custom lower control arms. As we mentioned back in episode 11, these trailing arms control the front to rear motion of the wheels, and point to the car's center of gravity to provide some anti-squat geometry. Although hard to tell from this image, one arm is long and the other is short, and like me. As it so happens, the GT6 is very, very tiny, and we really don't have room for the longer arms. We do happen to have two complete sets to work with though, so we're just going to use the short ones. This obviously will change the geometry a little bit, but we plotted it out and it still seems entirely reasonable. While we were doing some polishing last time, we couldn't help but tidy up the control arms too and install a fresh set of bushings. Yes, they're polyurethane bushings, which in the C4 community are known to potentially cause some binding in the suspension. Unfortunately, it seems rubber bushing sets are no longer being produced, so we're going with these, but ultimately could convert to some heim joints later if we have to. To be honest, even these short arms don't really fit in the space we have, so we are obliged to make some clearance. Well, that looked important. This box section <clears throat> used to be a major structural component of the body shell, and under normal circumstances, it would be monumentally stupid to cut it out. But as our new chassis is currently bolted to the body and helping to hold it all together, we can proceed safely. You may also notice a good chunk of the floor is missing here too. That's because the old chassis used to reside in this area, and as it does no longer, we can edge back a bit more room for seat clearance. More on that in a future episode. With it removed, you can see that we now have plenty of space for the trailing arms, so it's accomplishing what we need. Let's push onward. A bit more of that box section has been nibbled away cautiously, as we are still trying to decide just exactly how we are going to build strength back in. But finally, the last bit is gone, and we're left with even less floor than we had to begin with. Oh, happy day! In fact, the only bit of original floor down here now is that section in the middle. It's not all bad, because the old metal was nothing to write home about, but it was a bit of a setback, considering we'd already put in the time to seam weld it up months ago. Oh well, needs must. The next step will be to fill in those corners of the floor so a patch is cut out and our fancy sheet metal bender is deployed to put some bends in it, obviously. Although I have a notable hatred for butt welding sheet metal, it is what we elected to do here as I know it would make you all much happier. It definitely was not because of my OCD. Like I said, I distinctly hate butt welding sheet metal. 
However, I suppose it still looks better than a lap joint would have. Whilst our doppelgangers get on with the other side, let's turn our attention to building the new box section, as without it, the floor will literally flop around like an old wet floppy fish. Instead of the previous sheet metal 2x2 box, we elected to use some 8th inch wall 1x2 and 1x3. The 1x2 has these bends in place to clear the transmission tunnel, and it will get recessed into these 1x3s. Please note the sturdy 3x3s, helping to keep everything in line during welding, and there it is as one solid piece. A flat back with the grinder gets it looking more uniform, and we can now test it in place. All right, it's looking good. Believe it or not, this has gained us about two inches of clearance for the trailing arms and has even improved interior room by a bit. It will also act as a safety hoop by preventing the drive shaft from swinging through the floor in the event of a failure, which is a real nice feature. So it's a win, win, win. The sides of the body here were already a few layers of sheet metal, so we weren't too concerned about adding plates first they likely couldn't have hurt either. Please don't judge us by the aesthetics of these corners, they're not one of our proudest moments. With the sides of the new box welded up and secured in place, this area here can get hammered and clamped to the new crossbeam so we can seam weld the floor to it and prevent moisture from entering the car. That'll be easier with the body tipped over though, so first let's turn our attention back to those trailing arms. As you might recall from earlier, the arms hang out the sides of the chassis slightly. Ideally, the chassis would have been a bit wider, but there were other factors that came into play. So ultimately, we just need to fabricate some offstands and call it a day. After lots of thinking, we've now got a 2x4 with an extra half inch spacer mocked up in place and the arms bolted to it. You can see how the lower arm points up slightly, and if you follow the lines forward, this is where they meet our estimated center of gravity. Calculating the COG without weigh scales and, let's be honest, an entire car is way more involved than we want to get. So we worked off a basic 50-50 front to rear distribution and estimated the height to be about six and a half inches above the floor. Obviously this is rough, but we thought we'd aim a bit on the low side as worst case, the car will squat a small amount rather than lifting under acceleration which would be pretty weird. We'll need to weld in some sleeves, and although these galvanized lag bolts are a very cost-effective solution, we will replace them with some automotive-grade hardware shortly. We spent quite some time trial fitting the mount to find the ideal location for tire fitment throughout the full range of wheel travel. After choosing a happy spot and taking measurements, we pulled it out again so we could duplicate it and weld in those sleeves to prevent the bolts crushing the box. Back in place once again, only this time with both sides, you can see things are coming along nicely. Even with the odd shape of the GT6 wheel well, we've still achieved a nice balance of clearance and aesthetics. It's a far more aggressive fitment than what the car used to have, but retains some character, and we're just happy to have a decent sidewall, as 22 inch dubs, rubber bands, and lots of stance aren't exactly our taste. Some last minute checks with tape measures, rulers and levels confirm the location, and the offstands can finally get tacked into place for good. That's awesome, and if you've been wondering what our plans are for the trunk area, well, you're in luck. As a last step before we separate the body and chassis again, we need to install some 1 16th wall box tubing to begin the rear body structure. Two transverse sections go in first, fitting tight to the frame, as there are currently no rubber isolators anywhere. An X brace will then be added, as don't forget, the current one is only temporary. Obviously, this whole area will get skinned with sheet metal at a point, but that will come later, as the convenience of having no floor is far too helpful in the meanwhile. For example, our new fuel tank will be mounted externally and fill this area here, rather than sitting in the trunk like before. And the frame rails will be extended out to here and tie across with an impact bar to protect the tank both of which will be much more complicated to make with a floor in the way. The start of our new X brace is coming together now, and although I wanted to use a few more clamps, I suppose eight will suffice. This cold rolled stuff is a very welcome change of pace from the heavier tubing we've been using lately. I had forgotten how nice it is not having all that mill scale to grind off. 
they get tacked into place, and with that, everything back here is pretty much sorted out for now. Considering we've never done anything like this before, I'm very pleased with how it's turning out. Who would have imagined a Corvette rear end looking so at home in a little Triumph? Obviously, there are no shock absorbers or springs yet, and we're going to hold off until we have a better sense of the car's final weight. So, in the meanwhile, we've created some braces to hold the wheels at ride height. With that, it's time to take it all apart and get welding and grinding. That's all coming along nicely, and although I could use more practice, I think we're also pretty much at the limits of our faithful Lincoln in those corner joints. Luckily a grinder and paint will make me the welder I ain't. We certainly aren't concerned about parts falling off at least. Right now, the control arm mount is kinda hanging out all on its own, and friends don't let friends hang out alone. Anyway, let's just start to tie it into the rest of the frame. First up are these end caps. They'll get fused into place and smoothed off with a grinder, as usual. Next up are some gussets and caps. The gussets were a bit finicky to get right, but cardboard templates help out a lot. I originally wanted to plate over this whole area, but it honestly felt a bit overkill. I know, unbelievable, eh? So a simplified version will be used instead. Okay, our welder is getting its workout today. Where we can, we are chamfering corners to get maximum penetration. And this allows us to go over the weld with a flap disc and blend it in without removing the entire bead. These areas will get capped off as well, and we also need to extend the chassis rails here. Although we're at the back of the frame where there's not really a need for an insanely strong join, we nevertheless wanted to take this as an opportunity to practice splicing correctly as we're going to need to do this again up front. Cutting the box like this gives more area to weld and decreases the chance of fatigue cracking the joint. Up front, we'll also be adding a reinforcing plate inside the box as well.
The rear brace protrudes out the sides of the frame slightly to help with impact protection. And although we've extended the rails in a straight line right now, we're actually going to come back someday and put a drop section in to increase safety and help with a few other things you'll see eventually. These areas here have now been capped off and had drain holes incorporated and we also capped off the top of the differential mounts, paralleling the angle on the other side of the mount for aesthetics. With all that grinding, you can imagine there's a bit of cleanup needed. It's hard to stay perfectly tidy in such a small workspace, but we do try to keep on top of it. Probably the most satisfying thing you can do after all that work is wire brush the area to make it shiny. Mmm, shiny. It'll get a wipe down with some acetone and rust converted as we've been doing. Well, doesn't that look awesome? It's really funny how all your size references get thrown off though, as it's certainly much smaller than it actually looks. Everything is a super tight fit. The 205s appear monstrous, but amazingly, our narrowed Corvette diff looks more at home than we ever expected. We're halfway there. Okay, well, not even close to halfway. There's a ton of work that needs to happen up front still, but for now, let's get the body shell back in place and see how she's going to sit on the ground. Gosh, it's even smaller than I thought. Sitting at its final ride height, it's even lower than a Lotus Elise, which is saying something. Like I've mentioned in previous episodes, the frame has indeed reduced the ground clearance, but honestly, it's still really not that bad. Everything is fitting together beautifully, and we couldn't be happier. So tune in next time for when we answer the question, where the heck is the front end? Thanks for watching. Please help us out by sharing this video with a friend as YouTube is taking its sweet time getting our content in front of the right audience. A heartfelt thanks to our awesome patrons for their support, and if you'd like to see the next video a day early, check out the link on the screen now. Stay safe, and we'll catch you next time.